Puan Siti Huraira Sulaiman, the country chair of Shell Malaysia. Tan Sri Dr. Jamila Mahmud, Executive Director of Sunway University Centre for Planetary Health. Distinguished la guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Medica Award Trust, I am thrilled to welcome you today to the first Medica Award Talk Series for 2024, entitled Women in Leadership, Too Hot to Handle, held in conjunction with International Women's Day. Medica Award Trust was established back in 2007 through the support from Petronas and Shell. The Trust stands as a beacon of recognition for exceptional contributions made by both individuals and organisations to Malaysia. To our honouring remarkable achievements, our goal is to not only inspire future generations, but also to kindle a spirit of excellence that resonates throughout our nation. Over the years, the Trust has honoured more than 63 individuals and organisations for their outstanding achievements and today, we are very honoured to have one of these distinguished award recipients, which is Tan Sri Dr Jamila Mahmud with us, alongside Puan Siti Huraira Sulaiman, who is also our Board of Trustees. As we celebrate International Women's Day and the spirit of excellence, I want to take a moment to reflect the essence of leadership. While International Women's Day is often dedicated to honouring the achievements of women and advocating for gender equality, I believe it is also an opportune time to delve deeper into the qualities that make a great leader, regardless of gender. And I believe our two speakers today truly reflect that admirable quality of leaders that transcends gender, leaders who have vision, courage, and the ability to inspire others towards a common goal. Our first speaker, Puan Siti Huraira, has built a successful career in a traditionally male-dominated industry, shattering stereotypes and paving the way for others to follow. While Stansi Dr. Jamila, our 2015 recipient, whose leadership and compassion serves as an inspiration to us all, reminding us of the power of empathy, kindness and solidarity in creating a better world for future generations. Of course, not forgetting, we are delighted to have Miss Cynthia as well, our anchor, senior editor and producer at Astro Awani, as our moderator guiding us through this insightful discussion. I sincerely hope that this event fuels your aspirations and provides a sense of empowerment for us to strive for greatness. Thank you once again for being here. And so without further ado, let me begin this captivating conversation. Before I leave, I would just want to wish everybody in happy International Women's Day. Over to you, Cynthia. All right, thank you so much, Karina. Now, before we welcome our esteemed speakers to the stage, let's take a moment to appreciate their impressive backgrounds. First up, we have Pon City Huraira Sulaiman, a true powerhouse in her role as country chair of Shell Malaysia and senior vice president for the upstream business. Originally from Kuching, Sarawak, Pon City's journey with Shell began in 1994 as an operations engineer. And since then, she's climbed up the ranks, taking on various leadership roles within Shell, including project management, strategy, commercial services, just to name a few. It's a long list. Well, in 2023, this is the important part. Pon City made history by becoming the first woman to hold the position of country chair of Shell Malaysia. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, let's talk about Tan Sri Dr. Jamila a name that needs little introduction, if you're being honest. <laughs> Currently serving as the Executive Director of Planetary Health at Sunway University, Dan Sri is widely recognized as the founder of humanitarian organization, Mercy Malaysia. Throughout her illustrious career, she's held numerous leadership positions, including roles within, with the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, the World Humanitarian Summit at the United Nations in New York, various board positions in local and international NGOs. Her list of achievement is extensive to say the least and in the interest of time, uh, I won't go through everything, it might take an hour. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please join me to welcome both of them to the stage. Well, first of all, once again, thank you so much for coming over. Uh, we really appreciate your presence and I must start by saying it is truly an honor to be on stage in the company of both of you. Now, you've navigated some of the toughest industries out there. Oil and gas, 
humanitarian work, you've worked in so many conflict zones, and these are fields traditionally dominated by men, but both of you have proven that you've not only been successful, you've become really respected leaders in your fields. So I want to take this moment maybe to start with a bit of reflection of your journey so far. Um, let's start with you, Dan Sri. <laughs> I, I wonder, Dan Sri, if a young Jamila were to see where you are today, what would she say? Would she be in awe of the incredible journey that you've taken? Or would she say, yeah, I knew I was destined for greatness? <laughs> I think the young Jamila would say, is that all? Um, I think that my journey is far from complete. I feel I have a lot more to do and a lot more to achieve um, because there's just so much need right now, right? Uh, so, um, yeah, I think that's what young Jamila would say. And what about you, Puan City? Did you imagine that one day you'll be running the show in one of the largest energy companies? Yeah, no, thanks, Cynthia. I, I would say, you know, what I've always wanted to do, um, I really wanted to make my parents proud. Um, they work hard to raise all four of us siblings. Um, my mom was a, you know, a housewife, my dad a civil servant, and they worked really, really hard, right? Uh, I was carefree, by the way, right? I, you know, when I was young, and you know, I didn't probably see beyond two years in, in that sense, but one thing for sure, right? I wanted to make them proud and happy. Um, and I'll definitely come back to some of the stories uh, after this, Cynthia. I'm sure they're absolutely <laughs> proud of you. Now, uh, reflecting on your journey, could you pinpoint to us, uh, was there any particular moment, particular moment in your career that you felt that uh, was significant in your trajectory or your pathway to success, so to speak? You know, uh, before we, we came up to the panel, CT and I were exchanging our life journey. Uh, and we realized how similar we were. Uh, we're both half Chinese. Um, we both had a father who was in civil service and moms who were housewives. Well, mine began as a housewife. And both of us are really motivated by our desire to be good for our parents, right? Because that's the only thing we can do when they're gone. So for me, you know, that background, um, I would say I always talk about May 13th, 1969. I was nine years old. So you can count how old I am now. So, um, and I remember half my siblings look Chinese, the girls. Half look Malay. And my parents sat us down and said, when they come to our door, if they knock, if there's trouble, if there is a Chinese person at the door, the girls and mom, please go to the front door and the boys and dad will hide at the back. And vice versa, if there were Malays at the front door, the girls, please go to the back. And it struck me then, as a youngest child of seven siblings, why? When we had grown up with so much diversity in our life, um, and we had relatives who were of various colors, and I could not understand but what also happened was because my father was a civil servant, a very good man, very kind, my mom and dad were very much um, community people, right? And he had a map of the whole area we lived in. And he knew exactly which houses had women headed households, widows. He knew which house had bachelors. So he said, these are the places where we need to focus because the bachelors will never think about storing food and the women headed houses, households, we need help. And my uncle, uh, Uncle Joseph, who was then in the military, every time he passed with the trucks, he would drop to us some canned sardines and whatever. And my father, because he knew everyone in the market, when the, when the curfew broke, he would get supplies. And he and my mom would pack food in little bags. And because I was the youngest and very small and very short, uh, she, he, he would lower me into the monsoon rains and tell me where to go and I would be delivering food house to house for the people he felt needed help. I think my humanitarian career began on 13 May 1969 because my parents instilled in us compassion, cohesion, 
collaboration was critical. And I think that that stuck with me. I don't think I realized how much that created an impression in my life um, until you know, more recently when I kind of started to think back, why am I different from my other siblings? Why? And uh, on my mother's deathbed, I asked her, but why? Why did you choose me? There's lots of other stories where she would send me off to places to, to do things when I was about 13 and 14 years old onwards. And you know, she just looked at me and she said, because I knew you were different. So I think it's our parents who mold us, and I feel so blessed that I had parents who had embodied the spirit of muhibah, compassion, tolerance, acceptance, and it is in their memory. And you know, as a Muslim, the only thing I can do for my parents is to be good, a good person, so that whatever I get will go to them. Thank you for sharing such a personal story. Puan City, what about you? Was there a moment that was life-changing for you that really shaped your perspective? Uh, I would say I, it, perhaps two moments in life. Um, and I guess the first one was, you know, when I was in high school, towards the back end of my high school years, uh, when I had to make a decision uh, on my career, literally. Um, and at that time, my parents actually wanted me to be a doctor. Uh, country. So in your, prof you know, kind of your field of profession, um, you know, simply because my other siblings were, you know, I mean, at that time, you know, my brother decided to do, uh, you know, management, my sister went to do law, and me being the youngest, you know, they said, oh, we want you to do something different, right? So they thought of, okay, we want you to be a doctor. Uh, but deep, deep in my heart, I knew that I didn't want to be a doctor. Um, but I didn't want to disappoint them either, right? Because I wanted to make them proud. Um, then I was interviewed for a scholarship, and this was JPA, by the way. Uh, and JPA did give me the options, right? They were saying, okay, you, we can put you either into uh, medicine or pharmacy. And I thought, okay, pharmacy is not a bad thing because it's actually close enough to the medical profession. And I decided actually to accept um, you know, the scholarship from JPA, but in my heart, I was, still questioning, right? I mean, is this something that I really wanted to do at that time? Uh, but again, I wanted to make my parents proud and I wanted to fulfill their wish. Um, and literally just a couple of days before I left Kuching, it's my hometown, um, you know, before I left Kuching uh, to go to college, I got a call from Shell. And Shell actually offered me a scholarship, but to do engineering. And at that point in time, I thought, okay, this is my opportunity to just do something different and have a good excuse, right? Uh, you know, to my parents to say that, hey, look, I Michelle is giving me a great offer and, you know, and this is where I'm going to make you really, really proud. Uh, so I decided to effectively just shift, right, from JPA doing pharmacy to Shell doing engineering. And when I started off with Shell, so I did, you know, I did uh, study under the Shell Scholarship for a couple of years and then joined Shell uh, to be employed by Shell a couple of years after that. Uh, the one mission for me at that point in time uh, was just to make my parents proud, right? And the fact that I was not able to fulfill their wish to become a doctor, and I thought, you know, this is my opportunity to make them really proud in Shell. Now, whether or not at that point in time, you know, I was already thinking about being a country chair or someone senior, not at all. Uh, but I knew that, you know, there was going to be that pathway that I need to work hard, right, towards achieving that ambition. Uh, and I, I kept my options uh, very flexible along the way. Now, speaking about that path, um, I want to get right down to the heart of the matter, which is gender-related challenges. I'm sure in your professional career, there's been many ups and downs. Have you ever found yourself facing obstacles due to the fact that you're simply just a woman in your career? Thanks, Tree. Where do I start? Um, so many obstacles, right? When I started Mercy Malaysia, the rumor was I was in a very unhappy marriage and therefore wanted to uh, you know, start something to get away from my husband. Uh, all sorts of crazy things, right? Um, but, but there are many very funny stories I can tell you as well. When I became director in the UN, I was in charge of emergencies. Uh, and you know, being a Muslim woman, the first you know, sort of in hijab going into the UN and my boss then introducing me to ambassadors and so on. So here's my director of humanitarian response. And I promise you, everyone took a second look because like, 
woman, w Muslim woman in a headscarf, you know, was like, what happened here? Um, so, you know, I had to go through all those, uh, those barriers, not just from men, but also from women uh, in, in the UN. But I can tell you some really, really funny stories, right? When the earthquake happened in Pakistan, 2005, I was deployed as the team leader for the United Nations to do the whole assessment. At the time, I was still with Western Malaysia, but I, I double-hatted. I was also UN disaster team leader. And the person who deployed me was a, he passed away now, he's a Danish guy. And everyone said, how can you send Jamila to the front lines of the Pakistan-Indian border, and as at Jammu Kashmir, where there's actually a line of control where conflict is happening for those who understand the geopolitics. She's a woman. And he said, but you don't know Jamila. I have to send her. So I went. And I had to deal with generals and so on and so forth, right? And the funniest part was that I was waiting in front of the camp, and this brigadier came out with dark glasses um, and looked at me, and he said, when did you arrive from Kuala Lumpur? I was like, wow, the intelligence is amazing. Um, and I was like, oh, I, I arrived two days ago. I'm the team leader. Here's my card, la, 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 you know, in a very masculine environment, military and so forth. And we went on talking, and then you know, later on, he looked at me and says, Jamila, Jamila, do you not recognize me? Took off his glasses. He said, I'm Shaquille. My wife was your patient uh, in Malaysia when I was a you know, military attache. And I was like, oh, and everything just fell, you know, it's just, just collapsed, right? All those barriers. And then because I was a woman, I could go into houses because they're very conservative. And, you know, in that way, you influence the women, the women influence the men. So I think contrary to what barriers people put up, we women have to be smart, right? And really use our feminism to our advantage. Because in many of the places where I work, you know, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, Iraq, you name it, right, Sudan and so forth. Women are often hidden. Men are dominant. But you and I know, at the end of the day in the bedroom, the woman will tell the men what to do, right? So if you can convince the wives, these are the right things for your husbands to do, you get a lot of things done. I actually see a few men nodding enthusiastically <laughs> when you said that. <laughs> All right, um, just a bit about that. I want to go a bit more about, you know, yeah. the kind of qualities that women bring to leadership roles. But I want to get to up on City first. You know, as an Asian woman yeah. hailing from Malaysia, taking charge on the global stage, um, have you ever felt like you had to work twice as hard to get half the recognition? I, I think some of those are self-imposed, uh, Cynthia. Uh, it's almost like a self-belief that, you know, just because we're Asian, we're female uh, Asian, that we need to work harder, right? Um, and I think a lot of that actually are self-imposed. Uh, but I think to a certain extent, though, uh, there are some truths, especially for Asian women who are in senior positions in this part of the world. Uh, because of societal expectations, you know, cultural norms, you know, this whole piece around if you're here, particularly in Malaysia, Tansri, I mean, you know, being a, a Muslim Malay, for instance, you know, the norm is, you know, men go to work and women, you know, stay at home. It's quite a norm, right? And there is that societal expectation that actually puts pressure on Asian women, you know, that in a way kind of make them believe that they'd actually need to work harder, right, to, to prove themselves. Um, I did fall into that trap, to be honest. Um, so I did a couple of global roles in Shell um, and a couple of years ago before I, I came back into the Malaysia space. Um, there was one particular assignment where, you know, I was doing the global role out of London. Um, you know, it was a brand new organization for me. Uh, I mean, although, yes, we're one Shell, but there are so many line of businesses within Shell. And I was new in that space. I felt that I had to prove myself. Right? I, I felt that, look, I need to work hard uh, to build that credibility because I was not known in that space. So I did a lot of things like, you know, roll up my sleeves, um, you know, getting into just a lot of engagements, which actually on the hindsight, I shouldn't have, right? Because I had a, a full team yeah, that, that was supporting me at that point in time. I only realized that, you know, it was my own doing. Yeah, I, I think when, you know, that there was one occasion where there was a very open feedback coming from my own team to, you know, to effectively tell me that, uh, City, you are disempowering the team. 
right? And, and then we got into really that open and transparent conversation around the why. And I realized that by doing all of that stuff, I was indeed, right, you know, making the, the, the team feel disempowered. I, I made them, you know, feel as if that I don't trust them. And that was actually a key learning for me, right? Because I think for me, I was trying too hard to prove myself, whereas in actual fact, it was just okay to be myself. I, you know, they actually love, you know, kind of the real me, right? The authentic part of me. That was actually a huge lesson learned for me. Well, that's a great. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that because I want to delve deeper into the psyche of confidence. I know you hit the nail on the head is that uh, many women in the room it would be as competent or even more competent to the person next to her. However, there's always a hesitancy about our confidence, our abilities. And this, there are a lot of studies about it. And I, I do wonder, you know, what do you think leads to that? Do we always have to tick all the boxes, cross all the T's before taking the next opportunity? Why do we hold ourselves back? That's right. I, I think that um, we have to recognize that there, there is a gender difference. We are just, our chemistry is different, men and women. Uh, I think that the advice I give myself all the time is don't try to be a man, uh, be yourself. Uh, I don't think you need to be tough and you know, whatever. Um, and I think that by nature, we, we don't like to talk about our achievements as much as men, right? Sorry, men. But, um, you know, and, and this is classic in interviews. If you've interviewed uh, senior positions and you ask, you know, what have you done? The men will have like one, two, three, four, five, you know, and the women will be more humble and all. It's just our way. It's the way we are wired. And I think it therefore requ it requires people around women to understand that they are different, right? So when, for example, in a high profile job, if someone is not taking a woman to the job, I will ask what made you make that decision not to hire her. And you sooner or later you realize that they made that decision again based on impressions, right? And not on, on skills. So for me, uh, you know, uh, of course, I try very hard, you know, to be, you know, I was telling you earlier about being a small fish, big pond, big pond, big fish, small pond, right? That, you know, I always felt that so many things, not just being a woman, being a Muslim woman, being a woman from Malaysia, all these things, you know, where? When I was in the UN, how many Malaysians were there? Hardly any. So you always felt that you had to prove yourself, you had to do, you know, you had to make your country proud. You had to make, everything was, you know, rolled up into one and you had all these things on your shoulder until one of my, you know, very good friends, uh, mentors, and I've been very blessed. All the people who've guided me, a lot of them are male, right? And they said to me, Jamila, be yourself. Don't be hard on yourself. Uh, don't suffer from the imposter syndrome. You're good. If you're good, you just go and do that. And, I, and he said to me one thing. He said, don't try to be popular. If you want to be popular, you sell ice cream. But, you know, you're here to do a job, and you're here to do a job well. So I realized after a while, you know what? Me, what I say may really offend people, but I have to always speak truth to power. And I think when you are in positions of leadership, speaking truth to power is a huge responsibility. Thank you for that. Uh, Bonsiti, how do you push past that uh, self-doubt and the inner critic? You know, uh, Tansi was talking about imposter syndrome, which I believe a lot of us feel the same sometimes, like whether we are truly good enough for the job. Yeah, you know, you know I could absolutely relate uh, to Tansri's stories, right? I've definitely gone through uh, those moments myself, right? Self-doubt, you know, and actually, you know, others had to convince me uh, literally that, you know, I was capable, more than capable, right, to do, you know, some of the jobs uh, which I was being offered at that point in time. How did I overcome all of that? Um, I think a couple of things, right, and, and I'll probably start with the more, the more personal side of things. You know, sometimes, we're, you know, for the female and the girls, I would say, we love to surround ourselves, right, with just, you know, girls who, who, who like to just say positive things about each other. And I say this to my best friends, the reason why we're best friends is because we always say good things about each other, right? And I've, you know, probably some of you are able to relate that. So surrounding yourself with people who have got that positive mindset is super important to overcome the self-doubt, right? Um, simply because there's so much toxicity out there. Uh, there are a lot of individuals, organizations for that matter, who, who can be pretty toxic at times. 
and they're not helping you, right, to overcome that self-doubt. So I want to surround myself, right, with people who are positive and I'm so blessed that I do have, you know, lots of friends, good friends who are very positive. And within that kind of, you know, network, we try to reframe, right, problem statement into opportunity statement and really focus on our strengths. Right, rather than dwelling on things that we didn't go well. Now, I used to beat myself up, myself uh, hard, um, you know, whenever that I thought I didn't do quite well, I think I m have moved past that, right? Uh, and I thought to myself, why did I do that? It was because of that self-doubt, thinking that, gosh, you know, there are some, a lot of other people who are actually better than me. Um, and actually, Tanshri, to tell you the truth, right? when I look at your profile today, my goodness, you're such an illustrious person. I actually feel quite small <laughs> next to it. And I thought, and then, you know, and, 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 and actually, and, and then, you know, I, I had that kind of, you know, even yeah. self-doubt, right? And I thought to myself, why? Why do I have that self-doubt, right? Uh, we are both leaders in our own rights, uh, different industries, and we've got different perspectives to share. Um, all I'm saying, I guess, Cynthia, uh, Tanstri, those moments will always come back to you, right? It's about how do you cope and manage that in those situations. So it, it goes both ways, right? When I look at her profile, I was like, oh my God, you know, he's a corporate leader, you know. Probably, probably look at this do-gooder, like trying to do things, you know, doesn't know anything about management, you know. But but you know, but but you know, <laughs> but but the, the reality is that you know, if you have a mindset that is open enough to say that every person you meet has something to teach you and that you can learn from even the person who's serving you tea or coffee or something. There's always people you know, uh, that you can learn from. And to be humble in your approach, I think humility is such an important factor, it's something that my, my parents instilled in me, right? And, and I think that you know, one thing you mentioned about um, you know, the, the, the overcoming that ruminating and I will say that you know even at my age there are moments where I say ah oh, I wish I didn't do that you know you, you kind of ruminate for a while in the past it would last for a long time now it lasts maybe maximum half a day I can just say okay life is too short we have to move forward you know we keep thinking and one thing that I I put in place when I was working globally uh, is something called a failure festival uh, I told my team that if you don't fail it means you haven't taken any risk. You are not imagining things that can be done differently. You're afraid to innovate and you're not a good member of my team. I need people to be courageous, right? So we would have a failure festival. So we would share the failures that we are, the biggest failures of our year. And we will vote who has the best failure but best learning. And I think that's how you encourage, you know, that willingness to push boundaries a little bit. Because if you keep playing in the safe zone, you will just be playing there. You know, you can never discover the new thing that needs to be done. Love the idea of failure festival we need to have in every organization. Now, um, earlier, Puan City, you mentioned about having that support system, that network of friends, of like-minded friends. I, I do want to get back to you, Danstra, because you have such an illustrious career that's brought you to so many different places, uh, to the front lines of war, conflict zones, and you've had family, you've traveled everywhere. Talk to us about the importance of having the support system. I think my family is my anchor, right? I mean, I, I joke about my husband, uh, you know, my unhappy marriage. Uh, he himself was approached to say, hey, why don't you marry another one? Your wife, huh? always, you know, jalan jalan, go all these dangerous places, right? And his friend narrated to me his answer. And he said, yes, it's true. I wish that my wife was home more, but I cannot do the things that she can do. If you can, can you help her and take over? But if you can't, I think we all have to support her. And he said, and knowing my luck, um, if I do marry another one, it'll be someone just like her, and then I'll have <laughs> two wives going all over the world, and I'll be stuck with the kids, so no, I'm safe to stay with one. Uh, I think my husband is my biggest fan. Um, every time I feel I've had enough and <clears throat> time to slow down, he says to me, look, you are the runner, I'm the cheerleader. I can't do the things that you want to do, right? Um, I think now as we get older, he's quite happy that I'm busy because he can play golf more. Um, but the reality is that, you know, I tell to all single women, if you can't marry well, don't marry at all. 
very good advice. <laughs> now, the reason I've asked the question, because if you were to look at the talent pipeline, I mean the workforce, right? Women join the workforce in large numbers, but they also leave the workforce in huge numbers. And this tends to happen uh, around the middle to senior management levels. Uh, I wonder, Ponsati, you know, if you've noticed that trend uh, within your industry, your organization, and what contributes to that? Is it a lack of support system? Is it a lack of empowerment to step up to leadership roles? What is it? Yeah, no, I, I see that a lot, I, even within Shell, right? I, you know, and, and there are senior women who decided to just take a career break halfway uh, or just leave the organization, right? Because, for instance, they wanted to prioritize, um, you know, the families. Um, and interestingly, a couple, I think it was about two years ago, uh, Shell actually conducted a global survey. Um, you know, and this uh, survey effectively, um, you know, did an interview uh, on some of the women who actually left Shell. Uh, we wanted to understand a bit more in terms of the underlying causes. So a couple of sound bites uh, coming from that survey. Um, one sound bite was along the line that they felt unsupported. Um, you know, because for them, you know, there wasn't a proper support system around mentoring, uh, coaching, um, you know, for instance, and even the, the whole kind of succession planning. Um, in the minds of some of these women, it wasn't visible enough, right? They didn't see that pathway for them to be able to progress further. But one of the most common ones that we got from the survey was around the lack of support, right? Um, around the need to raise the families, um, you know, and especially those with young children. Um, and a couple of them actually quoted the fact that they needed to take a step back to allow for their partners to be progressed uh, in their career, right? And, and again, and actually, I don't think this is just true to Shell. Huh? And, and I think we have spoken with other uh, industry players as well. These are actually common themes. Um, and, and I do believe, though, if we want to change that trend or mitigate the risks um, you know, of women uh, leaving, we do, I, it's not just about corporates, right? Government, uh, various organizations, we all need to come together, right? To make it work uh, in order for us to promote the gender, uh, you know, diversity. And I mean, there are plenty of things I can talk through, uh, Cynthia, in terms of what we're doing. We shall, maybe I'll, I'll just share one quick example. Uh, and I'd love to hear Tansri's perspective as well on this. Uh, last year, uh, in Shell Malaysia, on the 1st of January um, last year, we actually implemented uh, you know, what we call the global minimum uh, standard for paid parental leave uh, that actually allows uh, non-birthing partners uh, uh, to access paid parental leave up to eight weeks. So this means, you know, non-birthing parents, you know, husbands, partners can actually go on for about eight weeks leave uh, to support their partner. And some of them, and, and it doesn't mean that you've got to take it immediately. Uh, you can take it within any time, within a, a certain period of timeline, right? Which then allows uh, the wives to come back to work and the husband stay at home, right? To look after the, the, the children. Um, so yeah, so that's just one example of uh, what we're trying to do in Shell to um, effectively support our female talents. I think we need a fundamental shift in uh, how we manage human capital. So I think Malaysia is quite behind. Uh, you know, if you think about the, the pandemic time, right, when everybody was working from home, uh, things got done, right? But you also realize that time that some stuff actually quite redundant, you could have got away with them, right? Gone away with them. But I think in the reality, the reality is, you know, your, your example is a really good example. You know, in the Scandinavian countries, for example, you get one year of uh, maternity, paternity leave shared between the couple. And if the partner does not take that leave, it's, for, it's burn, which means that there is a, there is a, it's a responsibility of the non-birthing partner to take leave to take care of the child. So I think, you know, th that's one. The second is that how do we allow women to continue in work, perhaps not 100%. So this is something, uh, I, I worked in Switzerland for four and a half years. In my team, um, Swiss law is very strange. On Wednesdays, the primary school children don't go to school. In the middle of the week, they just have a break. So of course, you know, the mothers say, who's going to take care of the child? So a lot of my staff are women who will not work on Wednesdays or they work from home on Wednesdays. And even, even now, 
is this recorded? Because my boss will see this. Um, my team, I think, is sitting over there. Uh, you know, I tell them, I really don't care when you're in office, but you need to come at least, say, twice a week or three times a week. But you, among yourselves, decide how you're going to distribute when you're in. But the work is clear, the target, what we want to achieve. As long as you achieve that, it really doesn't matter where you're working from. So, and I think that empathy for women to allow them and give them the confidence that you don't have to give up 100% to progress, but you know, take that step back. But how do you also educate our men, right? That it's okay to be inferior to your wife in pay or something like that, because it's a shared responsibility in bringing up the family. Right, so, so I think that it begins with us women as well educating our sons. So, you know, we talk a lot about gender equality, we talk about how men, and I, I, I you know, apologize, apologies to my Indian friends here. I always tell my Indian friends that you all talk about gender equality, things like that, but when you have a son, you still expect the dowry to be paid for your son. So unless you fundamentally also reject this notion that the male is superior to the female, then things will not change. It also has to begin with us, right? So my, 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 my kids, I think, are real feminists. Um, you know, so, so I brought them up to, to understand that men and women you know, are, have, need to have equity in life. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't, uh, and I think that you know, that's how you start, by having those conversations at home. Now, we've talked about the challenges that women face in the workforce yeah. and keeping them there. I do also want to touch a bit about the leadership uh, part, because if you look across industries, be it in corporate, um, policy making, politics, everything, women are still severely underrepresented in leadership roles, despite all the efforts that has been done over the years. Um, what do you believe is impeding a faster pace of change in reaching gender parity in leadership? Yeah, a, a couple of um, things in my mind, um, Cynthia. I, I think, f first of all, it's got to start off with ourselves, right, as women. Um, you know, that whole self-doubt that we were talking about early on, I, I think that's a huge blocker, right? And, and we, and, and I know we're doing a lot of things, again, across the corporates, you know, policy makers, um, you know, governments to effectively support, right, women to overcome that. Um, I think that whole support network that we spoke about, creating that platform, right, for women, female talents to be able to share uh, experience, uh, experiences, lesson learned, mistakes, failures, super critical. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad that, you know, many industry players, corporates, you know, do have those type of platforms, right, for women uh, to come together and to effectively get, um, you know, all the necessary support. Um, and then I thought about, you know, well, what is it that organizations need to do differently? Um, we need to set targets, you know, and, and often I think, you know, that it's almost like this cynicism around why do you need to set targets, right, to promote gender diversity? It's almost like giving women that sense of entitlement. I think in my mind, targets are really needed at this point in time because this is disruptive thinking, right? You need this to disrupt what I call the systemic biases, right? Because traditionally, um, yeah, you know, women, I think, as, as you rightly pointed out, uh, Cynthia, we always felt that we, we needed to work double hard to get into those senior positions where men probably felt that, yeah, you know, I would get it anyway. So I think we need to set some form of targets, right, in order to provide that disruption. Now, it doesn't mean, though, that, you know, it's entitlement for women to be able to progress. Um, we ourselves, as, as women, need to still be able to demonstrate that we can perform, right? We've got the ability, I mean, be it, you know, the, the kind of, you know, knowledge of the industry uh, or the leadership capabilities, we need to prove it ourselves that, you know, we are able to effectively transform uh, or bring the outcomes, you know, which are required by the, the respective businesses and the organization. So there's this debate about quotas, does it yeah. undermine meritocracy? What's your take on that? Where do you stand on that? Is it, um, is it necessary to promote more diversity and inclusion or is there a danger of setting quotas? 
I think it's necessary to have diversity and inclusion, but quotas help. Because it's not just, it's also about accountability of leadership. Well, you and I know that women and men now are equally capable in many fields. We, we have seen it. We've also seen the economic benefits of inclusion of women into the economic sector. We have you know, lost opportunities when you don't bring women on board. So I think that the quotas are one way for me to hold people accountable in leadership. The challenge, though, is what happens if the quotas are not met? How do we hold them accountable? I mean, you and I know, I don't have to say it, right? Parliament, corporate boards, everything. How many of them are failing in meeting the, you know, some degree of not even equality, talking about 30%. Why 30%, right? So I think that uh, it's, a, it's a lost opportunity. Now that narrative has to be in the center of everything. It's not about, you know, making women feel superior or men inferior. No, it's about the lost opportunity if we don't bring all talents to the fore. And I think it's a bad excuse when you say, oh, it's meritocracy and so forth. What? You think what? Women are not uh, credible? Surely they are. But on that point of creating the platforms, one thing I must say that worries me is that a lot of these platforms are quite elitist. They're at, you know, they, how do we bring middle normal people who probably are unseen in terms of their talent to to be able then you know how, how do we have a almost like a talent spotting sponsorship kind of mindset to see you know i see somebody there they're not really c-suite or high level but i see something special in that person how do you bring them in right uh, and it applies to both men and women i think right to be able to give the non-elite not in the 30% club or whatever, you know, whatever that I don't belong to, but you know, th those kind of groupings. So the ordinary people are also given a chance. Let's talk about that, the leadership, uh, mentorship in leadership. Uh, yeah. three. How do you practice that within your organization? Uh, because what I found really interesting about you is that I've heard that you've made it a goal to ensure that at least three female employees are ready to step into your shoes before you leave an organization. Talk to us about that. So this started way back when I was a doctor. And um, I, I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist uh, by training. Uh, and um, at the time when I qualified, 1990, some of you not born, um, but I was the eighth Muslim Malay gynecologist in the country, number eight. And I'm not that old, for God's sake, number eight, right? And I said to myself, why? in a field of obstetrics and gynecology where a lot of women are more comfortable with women and they cannot find women to go to. So I made a promise to myself that I would not leave, I was teaching in the university, I was in public service, I would not leave till I actually see three women become specialists that can then, then take over my role. And I wait that until three women are sort of hurry up guys, you know, <laughs> like, you know, um, qualified as specialists and then I stepped out. And I've done that in everything that I've done now, you know, um, people who know me well will always accuse me of having too many women in my organization. Um, but uh, are they ready then to take over from me? Some may not be quite, but they're ready to play leadership roles. There are a lot of women in the leadership roles outside there who have worked with me, and I'm very proud of them. They are even better than me, I think, in so many ways. So I think setting a goal for yourself that, you know, success for me is when I see people who I've worked with achieve more than I can because I think that shows that I had a small, you know, small part to play in their journey, right? So, and, and, and another um, rather morbid thought, right? When, when, I, when I was in Switzerland uh, and the pandemic broke out um, and I woke up one morning and I said, oh gosh, you know, if I have COVID now and I die alone in my house because Swiss had no way of testing and all that, that's another story. But um, I said, who can take over for me? And I thought very, very hard about all the people I've worked with from Malaysia. And I tell you, I had a real problem trying to see someone who could take over my role. And that was the decision I made. I have to come home, right? And I have to go into a role where I will be working with young people uh, and women and others to make sure that they develop a global mindset. They understand the challenges that we're facing in the world today. 
and they will help to find those solutions. So that's how I, I came back to establishing a center in a university setting. So I think ultimately, education is key. Uh, we have to fix education in this country. We don't send ki kids to school to be schooled. We have to send them to be educated. Great. What about you, One City? Um, is passing the torch on to someone else something that you think about now? I know, absolutely. Um, maybe one thing that I wanted to, something that you said, Tansi, you trigger uh, my thought as well around kind of the almost kind of the all women, um, you know, too many women in the organization. That was your statement, right? Um, I think a couple of years ago, I, you know, I was in, a, in this panel, um, you know, of interviewers and we were in interviewing uh, quite a number of candidates for, you know, a couple of uh, global roles. Um, you know, at the end of the interview, it was, it was quite funny though. Uh, three of us, there were three of us, and we looked at each other and we thought, okay, we're all female uh, panelists. Huh? I mean, like interviewers, and and we started to question on whether or not there would be an issue around diversity or potential kind of misconception that we would be biased, you know, in terms of selecting female candidates and all of that stuff. Five minutes later, we said to ourselves, why are we even questioning ourselves? And I'm, I'm sorry again for our, uh, you know, kind of female, uh, male, uh, you know, kind of audience members. Um, and we said this, right? Um, had the panel members been all male, they would not be having this similar conversation, right? Um, and we corrected ourselves, right? Literally within five minutes. And we said, look, let's stop having this conversation. Um, so th that was interesting when you said that. So going back to, I, I guess, kind of the, the succession planning, I call it. Um, absolutely. Uh, I mean, this is something that, you know, I've been, um, you know, paying a lot of attention. I mean, not just in terms, you know, when I came into the role last year, but over the last couple of years as well, um, even when I was doing global roles uh, across Shell. Now, one thing about Shell, when you get appointed into um, uh, senior positions, um, the decision is not made in country. Uh, because we're global in nature, uh, the decision, the succession planning uh, happens at a very global uh, senior level. Um, that means there are a lot of uh, people that, you know, you need to influence, right? So for, you know, for me to develop my successor is not just my decision. Uh, it requires me to, um, you know, effectively influence quite a number of senior uh, global people yeah, across the Shell organization. Um, and I remember, and again, one example that I share, about three years ago, we had a, a major reorg uh, in Shell. And again, I was part of this global panel, resourcing panel, where we had to select candidates into very senior positions. Um, and you should have seen uh, the names of, um, you know, candidates being proposed for those global, very senior roles. 98% um, of them are, you know, male Caucasian candidates. Um, and I literally had two female Malaysian names on my list, and I needed to push, right, for these two female talents. The kind of conversation that I had during that, that panel, I, I wouldn't even want to share it with you here today, right? I mean, it was just horrifying, right? I mean, to think that, you know, the credibility of our female Asian talents were not visible or not recognized. And it took a lot of hard work for me to be able to convince the panel members that these two female talents are equally good at par or even better, right, than some of the, the other talents were on that list. But it was hard work. And that's the key challenge that I have today. And I've got names, um, but the key challenge for me is to be able to influence and convince my global stakeholders. I, I think this is, this is a common problem we face, uh, in not just in the corporate world, but also whether it's the UN or you know large organizations, governments, and so forth, right? Um, you know my own experience, my own journey. Uh, I sit on a on the board of a very very large corporation in Switzerland, um, and when I was headhunted, I thought, why are they headhunting me? Are they trying to tick a diversity box? Uh, and I actually talked to the headhunter. I said, why am I included in this headhunt? This is a major, you know, five hundred billion dollar company. Why? I couldn't believe that you know they wanted someone with my profile, 
And and they would say, no, no, you 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 know you have come up highly recommended, blah blah blah. And I went. It, it was a one year process to get onto the board. And in every interview, you know, I felt I myself felt like, why am I here? Because I'm the only non-white person that's going to be on on the board. Um, and you know. I had to wait to be reassured when I was actually appointed, you know, by the by the <laughs> the people there. They said, number one, says we are so bad at understanding the world, and we don't understand diversity. We talk about diversity, but we are not diverse. Number two, you know, the world when the company was formed 200 over years ago or whatever uh, is very different from the world today, and you can give us real world perspectives. And number three, they said, gosh, you really challenge us at the interview. You're not afraid to tell us that you didn't agree. And very few people will come to an interview. But I said to them, I had nothing to lose. I thought you would never take me, right? So, 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 so of course I challenge, right? Um, but, but so I think there are real issues out there, right? But what was the first thing I did when I got onto the board? I said, we don't have any Africans. And then, you know, they said, uh, you know, I said, we need an African on the board. While I'm still on the board, we need to bring an African person onto the board because, uh, okay, it took, a long, it took you a hundred over years or whatever to get an a, a Asian. Let's now not wait that long to get an African person onto the board. If you want to really talk about diversity and inclusion, we need someone with disabilities to be on the board to understand the challenges of people with disabilities, right? We need to have real diversity, not just, you know, ticking that box of diversity. So I think all of us can learn from this. I think all of us need to improve. And anyone here has anyone with, you know, knows anyone with disabilities who's looking for a job, please tell me. I would love to hire the person, right? Because I think that we don't give enough exposure and opportunities for them. So, yeah. Well, Thank you for sharing that. Um, we have a couple of minutes left, I think. Yes, Nadia? Okay, so uh, before we take your questions, please get them ready. We will have a mic to come to you later when you have the question. Um, before we wrap up, um, I do want to get your thoughts about what, it, what does it make? I mean, what is a great leader? You know, what makes a great leader? In my opinion, the greatest leader is one who has genuine empathy is not just compassion it's empathy being able to understand what it's like to be in the other person's shoes my hero is nelson mandela right we talk about leadership um and i have invictus on my ipad every time i feel down i watch it again also because i love rugby um and the one scene that i play over and over again in my head is when he first took office and his chief of staff came in and said the staff are ready to say goodbye because he th they thought that because it was a new government, all of them would have to leave. And basically, they were Africans. They were white. And he said, let me go and speak to them. I wish I can speak like Nelson Mandela and imitate him. But anyway, he went to them. And the first thing he said was, I need you to rebuild this country. We need each other. And if you are with me, please don't, don't re unpack your things and stay. And that kind of leadership that has so much empathy, can you imagine what it feels like to suddenly feel you've probably lost your job, you have a completely different leadership that probably doesn't like you, you know, all the things that you conjure in your head, right? And here's a man who comes with gentleness, empathy, to tell them that actually I need you, right? And we need each other. So I think empathy for me is critical. What about you, Pon City? What sort of leadership speaks to you and that you hope to pass it on? I, I think for me, it's being true to myself, being authentic, being CT, right? And not afraid to be vulnerable at the same time. Um, I mean, I've gone through painful experience before and, being, and actually being vulnerable is the hardest thing. Um, and, you know, they were moments and one particular moment that I, I don't mind sharing as well where you know I literally had to stand in front of my team uh, to replay back right the feedback that I got from them around my development areas um, and and you know as humans we are all proud around our strengths right we want to be recognized we like to hear the good things um, you know but but there was something that my team actually said that pointed to 
you know, my development areas, things that I needed to work on as a leader. Um, my ten, you know, the, the kind of the, the, the first reaction was to be defensive. Huh? Um, but I was coached at that point in time to embrace the feedback, right? And, and to really just hold back, listen, and replay that back to your team, and importantly, to commit on what is it that you want to do differently as a leader. That was the hardest piece because it meant that I had to be vulnerable. But the power of doing that, you know, not to be underestimated, right? It changes, it changed the whole dynamics within the team, not just in the room that day, but just the, the dynamics of the team going forward. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dan Sri and Buan City, for sharing your amazing, amazing journey. Let's please give them a, a big round of applause. Now, we'll turn it to over to you. And if you have any questions or feedback or anything you want to say to our speakers, just please raise your hands. We'll come to you with the mic. Yeah. We have quite a number, so we'll take turns. I will start with the lady at the back. I saw that she raised her hands first. OK. You want to like some a little? Oh. Can you uh, state your name and where you're from? Yes, uh, I'm Pavani from Petronas. Uh, thank you. That was an inspiring talk by you both. Um, how can you build your support system when you have literally no one to support? Everyone can't be your best friend, right? And your colleagues cannot be your best friends too. Outside work, how can you build your support system that helps you improve yourself as a person and also perform at work. Thanks. That's a, I think a great question. I think as leaders sometimes. I can share. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll start, uh, you know, first. No, I fully agree, right? I mean, support system, uh, you know, does not come naturally to all, put it that way, right? I mean, some of us are blessed, you know, that we have kind of the almost ready support system, extended family, uh, best friends, you know, childhood friends, right? But not all of us are in that same uh, situation. Um, and, and some of this will require time. Um, and, and I do believe that it's okay for you to also have your own personal me time. Uh, and it always starts with, you know, you, well, ourselves, right? Knowing, you know, what is it that motivates, motivates us? What, what is our purpose in life, um, right? I would always go back to that basics, right? Um, and then kind of, you know, building your way, right? In terms of building uh, your support systems or network, um, you know, or even just finding little ways, right? Um, you know, to kind of, take you away yeah, from the stress and the pressure at work. Um, and a couple of things that I, I do, I, and it's not just about you know, sharing stories with best friends, you know, as I said uh, before, there are little things in life that I do enjoy. Um, you know, I do enjoy, for instance, just you know, uh, going out and, and being in the outdoor. Being in the outdoor actually gives me a peace of mind. Right, when you kind of walk, and I think for me, I find peace, yeah, when I go hiking, for instance. I love walking, by the way. And those couple of hours that I, I spend outdoor um, actually gives me different perspectives about life, right? And then, you know, from there, you can effectively just find different ways and different ideas, right, to do different things in life. Uh, the other piece about support system, and I think Tansri, you spoke about partnership at home. Maybe I'll use that term. I truly believe in that, right? Um, now, to tell you the truth, when I first got, so I got married like, you know, 28 years ago, right? I didn't look at my husband like he was my best friend, I can tell you. I, I don't think I was able to share a lot of things with him at that point in time, right? And when I started off, um, you know, well, in Shell and we met and we got married, you know, there was something there around me thinking, we've got to make it work for both, right, in terms of career. Um, and I felt obliged about stepping back because I needed him to progress. But over time, my perspectives change. Over time, his perspective changed. And over time, we became best friends, right? So it didn't start from day one, that support system, even at home, right? I felt obliged to just give in and to take a step back. But over time, I can tell you both of us evolve. And today, without him, being my COO at home, I call him my <laughs> COO, 
<laughs> at home, I don't think I can be here where I am today. It takes time. I think that's a, a great question, but I'm also going to get you to re-examine what you understand by a support system. Because a, a support system can appear in many, many ways. Right? Uh, from my understanding of your questioning, you're asking the people who will support you to maybe move forward in your career, in your life. And I think for that, you have to know yourself best. Um, Self-awareness is extremely important. And I think maybe where we may be aware is that we are both very self-aware. We know where our vulnerabilities and our weaknesses are. So if I know where those vulnerabilities and weaknesses are, I want to find people who can support and help me in those areas that are vulnerable. Unlike you, Siti, I surround pe myself with people who will say no to me and who will question me and be critical of me. Because I think that there, you know, as you go on in life, you know, everybody wants to be nice to you if you reach a certain level of success, but very few will want to tell you where you're not going, doing the right thing. And I think I'm very blessed that I have people who are able to tell me straight in my face that, mm, you know, that's not the right thing to do. Have you reconsidered this? Or, or just to be, come on, you've got to be kidding, right? But, but I think getting that kind of support system is also important. Now at home, you know, I talked about my husband, I didn't talk about my kids, so I have two sons. And I think if I could turn the clock back, I could have done things better with the children. I think, I think they did miss me being around for a long time. But I had a fantastic support system. Just, you know, to me it was blessing from God, right? Uh, a woman appeared in our life who's been with us 30 over years now, who has been that surrogate mom to the parents, right? It's never the same. But at least I knew there was stability uh, with the children. Um, and I think those support systems are equally important because how can you go to work knowing that you know, your children, you know, how are they going to fare and so on and so forth. And then the other support system are the people who allow you to be your crazy self uh, you know, in a safe space. Because um, I, don't, I never used to share this, but I do now that you will find very difficult to believe. I'm an extreme introvert. Um, to, for me to sit and speak here with you means for the next six hours, I will be hiding alone in my room um, for the rest of the night. I, I really have to work very hard to be the Jamila that you see. But so, you know, if you know yourself, you know where your strength comes, you also have the courage to be able to say, I can't, I can't do this. Right? I can't do too many social things at one time. Um, I need to recall and my social support system will be the closest person next to me, my husband or, or best friend, my book, my cat, you know. Um, and those are the things that give me comfort when I need to heal. So I think you need to be able to identify those you know, know your vulnerabilities and so, so and so forth, right? Of course, when I have one, I have a crazy time. I go and see Nicole, right? And and she's trying to you know, challenge me to a squash match. And I, I said, I don't want to beat you and embarrass you, but you know, <laughs> but but uh, but you know, we've got friends like that who will just be ourselves and laugh and cry or laugh at each other, or whatever, right? But having that safety net as well, I think, is very very important. And one lesson I will teach you, because you are younger than me, is that it's okay to have few friends. But you have to have people who will love you for all your weaknesses and will care for you to point them out. Great. Fantastic. Hi, my name is Nini Chong. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, so, Tan Sri, um, you spoke about um, speaking from truth to power. You spoke also about, you know, if you want to be likable, then be the ice cream person, right? Um, Puan City, you spoke about operating through authenticity and um, being vulnerable. So this, uh, everything that both of you have said, 
has a lot of relation to truth and knowing my truth, right, as a person. But really, the reality is, as we operate from um, speaking from truth, speaking from truth to power, being vulnerable, being authentic, reality is not many people are able to accept the truth. So this, I think, is relevant to most areas in our life, in our family, with our children, with our husband, and at our workplace. So as we speak our truth, as we operate through authenticity and vulnerability, right? Sometimes it gets people to a very uncomfortable position. My question would be, how am I able to operate this way, right? Because it's in all books, many gurus speak about this, but there's always the reality. How do I operate from this, right? What you have shared and said, but not to second guess myself because the outcome of making others uncomfortable will lead to making me second guessing myself. And that will, that second guessing is always at the back of my mind. So how do I maneuver my truth and still get the job done? and still uh, deliver results. Thank you. I, I'll probably go first. Um, the truth is, it's not easy. <laughs> um, it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of resilience. It takes a lot of going through the hardship and pain points, right? For you to be able to have the courage to tell the truth and you know, and in the reality of the world where, you know, not a lot of people sometimes want to hear the truth. Um, I, I'll share with you perhaps one experience where, and, and this is in, in the context of performance management. I, I think many uh, organizations have got performance management system and, you know, we conduct performance conversations uh, with our employees. I had to deliver a very hard message to one of my uh, team members around performance. Um, you know, from my assessment, uh, he wasn't performing, not because he, he did not have the, the capability to do the work, um, but it was his behavior that was coming in the way. And I wanted to demonstrate the point that performance um, needs to be balanced. Eh? It's not just about the ability to deliver the technical aspect of the work or the commercial aspect of the work, it's got to be done in a respectful manner and you know, you, uh, uh, with appropriate behaviors. Um, it was the, 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 a difficult conversation because the individual uh, you know, has always been rated you know, kind of high or superior in the organization because he was always able to deliver. And the behavioral piece was a secondary piece. When I came into that role, uh, for me, I had to say the truth. I, I, I couldn't tolerate that. It was not acceptable to me, right? And hence that difficult conversation. Now, that moment, you know, it took a lot of courage for me to do it, right? It took a lot of courage for me to effectively convey the message around the why. You know, I don't rate him as superior as, you know, the, the, the years before. Um, the person couldn't accept the truth, right? And you know what he did? Uh, you know, he effectively walked out of the room, slammed the door in my face, literally. And at that moment, I questioned myself, right? Was that the right thing to do? I even questioned myself, was that the right thing to do? And, you know, and, and cut the story short, I reflected on it. And th th there was one lesson for me. Caring doesn't mean that you've got to be nice. Caring means you must have the courage to tell the truth because I, my intention was to help him over the long term. It was not just that short-term performance conversation, but it was hard. It took a lot of courage. I, I think you asked a really important question that all of us grapple with, right? How do you speak truth to power and be, be, be truthful without you know, a lot of damage in the process? I will say for myself, I've made a lot of mistakes. 
right? Um, I can be pretty sharp with my tongue. Uh, I can tell people off without blinking. Uh, and it's led to more problems than any good. So I have had to learn myself. And I think the biggest lesson I learned was, is that if you want to be able to speak truth to power, are you willing to hear truth straight in your face? And I think that when you reach that point where, yes, you can tell me off and you can tell me where I'm wrong and I can take it and actually be very grateful for it, that someone's willing to tell me, then I'm ready to, to move to that next phase. I think at the end of the day, I take a very simple method methodological approach. One, everybody, no matter how bad, has some good. Number two, there are many things that we may disagree, but there's always something we may agree on. Start from what you agree on and start from that place of goodness and always think good things of the person. When you're giving feedback that's painful, you also have to acknowledge the good in that person or whatever good qualities or whatever, right? And then the third thing is there are many ways to skin a cat. There are many ways to deliver a message um, without being offensive or, you know, and sometimes the way you do it, I've had people kind of look at me and say, oh my God, I've really failed you, you know, I really should leave. Rather than, you want to, you want to, you want to terminate me, you know, I'll see you in court or something. But, you know, I, I'm known in the International Red Cross as a person who came in and within one year put one person in jail. So, you know, it, it, that was my reputation, right? Because I really go hard down on integrity and stuff like that. But, but you know, and, and the last thing, I, I say it as a joke, but m one of my bosses in the UN used to say to me, you know, Jamila, when we retire, we should start an ego massage institute. Because at the end of the day, everyone has an ego. You have an ego, I have an ego. How do you manage that ego? You know, because at the end of the day, you cannot let the person lose face, right? But you, you, you deliver the message in a way that is, you know, tough, but a bit of tough love. Uh, and to accept the fact that, again, there will be people who will not like you. There are people who hate me. I get hate mail, right? But, but it's okay. Because, you know, I tell myself for every one like that, there may be a hundred who really care. And at, at the end of the day, you know, and this is the final thing I will say, you know, on this thing, I ask myself, how will I go to sleep that night? If I can put my head on the pillow and feel I did not wrong anyone and I can go to sleep, which is every night, then I think I'm okay. Because your mental well-being, your self-awareness is going to be critical. Thank you for that, Tansri. Let's take a few more questions. I saw some hands earlier. I over okay, we'll come to you right after. You Hi, first. Tansri. Assalamualaikum. I'm Ely. I'm and City. Hello from Shell Mobility. Um, you just now you had mentioned in some of your comments. Sometimes women can also sabotage yeah. ourselves, right? Yep. What can we do better? How do we do that check-in for ourselves? And how then do we improve to help other women and be yeah. the sort of transparent support system to help them? Yeah. Have you experienced it? Yeah. Have you ever experienced being? Because um, <laughs> I experience that every day. Okay. <laughs> I have a lot. Like sometimes, yeah. you know, the dynamic, it's a weird dynamic, right? Yeah, like yeah, women yeah. do not want to support or assist yeah. others. Is it because of competition or are there other factors to it? I think that, first of all, it's not all women. Huh? It's just a small, unique, very special women who are like this. Um, <clears throat> I think because some people have had to struggle so hard to get to where they are, they feel they need to protect it and therefore Again, a lot of women feel they need to be more masculine in their leadership, that competition, that, you know, rather than collaboration and collegiality, right? I think that the most important thing is to be able to identify who these women are. I've had, you know, women trying to sabotage me. I told you about the time I was in the UN. A, a group of women went to my boss and, say, and said, how can you hire this woman uh, in a headscarf to be your director of emergency response. You have sent the wrong signals of a, a woman who's suppressed and oppressed to lead this uh, on, on these things. And of course, my boss looked at her and said, did you even know her? 
she's the last person that I would say is oppressed, suppressed, or you know, under <laughs> under patriarchal, whatever. You don't even give a chance to get to know her, right? And and she, uh, my boss used to say she can make men blush, uh, you know, and and she she's she's like that, and she's herself. So I think you know, find other women who are like you to stick with you. And and I I still say treat them with empathy and try to understand why did they become that way, right? I've had a very senior retired politician woman uh, saying to me that she doesn't believe that we should promote women, it's all meritocracy. And I said to her, you are only saying that because you have achieved the highest level of leadership without much competition, and you expect everybody to be like you, but not everyone is built the same way. Right? So I think that being able to, to understand where that feeling is coming from and meeting them halfway. The last point I will make is that find male champions. They are the best. Right? They will be the ones that will stick with you. And if any woman is giving you trouble, the men will come after them and, and, and speak up uh, on your behalf. I've been very lucky uh, with that, right? And, and I think that, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know what? You can't please everyone. So you do what you can. You try to meet them halfway. You try to build that bridge. But if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. No, I, I, I fully agree. Um, I, I think this is a minority, right, Ili? <laughs> you know, I'd like to believe that it's a minor, special group, as that Sri put it. Um, you know, and, and I think, you know, for me, you know, I, I've had a couple of experiences like that. Not so much of being sabotaged, maybe that's not the word, but not supported, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a better term. Um, I mean, there was, for instance, you know, one occasion a female leader said to me, if you want to be successful in Shell, uh, you've got to be, you know, uh, uh, you know, able to sacrifice certain things in life, especially around the whole kind of, you know, family priorities. The minute she said that, to me, I felt so demotivated because at that point in time, I had a young family, um, you know, and the guidance given to me was you've got to be prepared, right, uh, to even leave your family behind and, you know, and go pursue whatever career somewhere else, right, and then come back. I mean, uh, more of a personal commute, right? That was the advice uh, to a young mother. I was a young mom at that point in time. Um, but you know what? I actually turned that into a challenge and I said to myself, and actually I was looking around the shell system at that point in time, trying to find a role model. A role model like a successful uh, female leader um, who had made it right through that journey and having that balance. But I couldn't find one. And I challenged myself and I said to myself at that time, if I cannot find this role model within Shell, I've got to create one for myself. Um, and I, I was clear at that point in time that from a priority perspective, I would never put my family second to career. And I had made lots of tough choices, right, around saying no to certain career opportunities because I needed to prioritize my young family. And you know what? I have no regrets. I never look back and regretted any of those decisions. Thank you for that great question. Can we go to that lady uh, in the great room? Yes, you. <laughs> Hello. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, um, Tan Sri. Thank you, Puan City, for sharing your experience being in leadership. Thank you, Cynthia, for leading the discussion. So, um, I just, I will separate my, my feedback into two things. The first one is sharing how relatable it was being, you know, when, when you are outwardly different, I and mean, we are obviously different from a group of people, there's always the dilemma of do I blend in or do I stand out? So as much as you, you feel like you might be invisible, that your voice might not be heard, you also want your voice to be heard, but you don't want to stand out that much because somehow when you say something wrong, then all the different traits that you have on you will be the target. So those are some of the, the things that I often face when I'm in a, a room of uh, people who are, might not be the same as, as uh, how I look out, outside on the outside. So I think that's really something that I've, I've also, I really relate to, to whatever was shared uh, today, especially because I'm in education um, transformation, uh, focusing on 
leadership and very physical learning spaces. So that's something I totally relate to. Thank you so much. So my question is quite straightforward. Um, if you could summarize perhaps three strategies or advices, um, what would it be um, in order for you to find network or mentorship among people in order for you to really, not, not to be popular, not to be the ice cream man, but to really expand the reach of your initiative. Thank you. Did you both have a mentor in your careers? Don't force yourself, right, to uh, find a mentor just for the sake of having a mentor. I'll, I'll start off with that. Um, I've had a couple of mentors before throughout my career. Now, today I don't have a specific mentor, but I do have network of leaders that I connect with. Um, not regular, sometimes ad hoc, uh, but you know, diversity of mentors or, or leaders, right? I think that that's what I need at this point in time. I, I think you've got to look at your own needs, right? What what is it that you know you're looking for in the context of say your development or areas where you need support or help? Um, now, whether it's a mentor or coach, it depends on again what you need. But like I said, I, and I think for me, my own lesson learned, you've got to have chemistry with the mentor or the coach. Uh, there was a point in time where I was actually paired with a mentor in Shell, and you know, at that time, I think for some of my colleagues here, they, they're probably familiar with this. Years ago, we used to have this very structured uh, mentorship program where we were literally paired, right? We had no choice, uh, but as you know, talents, you know, we are being paired with senior leaders. So I had a, you know, a senior leader, who I, one senior leader as my mentor. I had the f first conversation with my mentor, at the end of the conversation, I just knew that there wasn't any chemistry or whatsoever. <laughs> the second time that we met up, you know what I said to him? I don't think this is going to work. <laughs> I literally said, you know, it was a divorce, literally, right? You know, eh, you know in, in, in the, uh, the second conversation that we had. And it was okay. And he completely understood it, right? And he said, yeah, you know, his advice to me was look for a mentor where you know you've got the chemistry. You can relate to the person. You are able to build that trust. That's super important. So for me, lesson learned, don't make it as a, as a tick box exercise. Huh? I mean, having a mentor is not just a tick box. It, it needs to meet your purpose and objective as well. I completely concur. And I think the important thing is it has to be really... Uh, authentic, right? It cannot be something that you impose. Oh, I need to have a mentor. I need to have a coach. Uh, let me tell you a story. In 2008, I was um, a humanitarian in Mercy, Malaysia, and uh, I was picked to join the IMD in Lausanne, a business school, uh, to to be in a senior senior management program. Um, and I was the only person from a non corporate world. After two days, I was in the toilet crying. Right? And, and then my professor said, why are you crying? And I said, these people. I said, they call me Mother Teresa. I said, you know, how, how, can, how could they, they do this? Right? They don't even see me. Um, you know, and not that Mother Teresa is not a great person, but that means you only see this, you know, this image of me. When, whereas I'm here to be part of a management, senior management team, CEOs, CFOs, and all that were there from global companies. And she said, you can either choose to roll back now and, you know, she, I thought she would say, oh, come, Jamila. I don't know. She told me off, right? She said, no, you either stick it out uh, and, you know, learn to live with the fact that you've been in this very sheltered place of people who want to do good, welcome to the real world, um, or you can leave. But we assign you a coach. And my coach and I fought every day, right? And because... I couldn't see her point of view, but eventually we became friends and she remains someone I can still rely on when I need help. That changed my life because for once I was exposed to the hard world of finance and corporates and all that. And I wanted to do it because I said, how can I run a humanitarian organization that has re receiving public donations of millions without having a clear understanding of good management, integrity, you know, good governance and so forth. So I put it on myself to, to improve. 
the nice thing though is that I became the first woman and first non-corporate to be voted the most valuable participant. At the end of the, that time, uh, everybody wanted to be a humanitarian and no longer a corporate leader, right? But but it was but it was really fun. You know, the learning that you get from each other, you know, so much so that, and they became part of the mentoring group for me because I knew I don't understand finance as well as them. So if I had to ask them a question on on finance, they created a website called IMD, I can make a difference where I could go to them and ask them difficult questions. Uh, you know, that They became my support team, a virtual support team that I say, I have these operations here and I need to do this, that and the other and I'm wondering is there a better way to do it? And somebody from that you know cohort would give me uh, advice. So I think you know it will come, don't rush and it has to be you know, it develop organically with people you're comfortable with, right? But also, you have to know where you, your, your deficiencies are. One thing, I think some of my team members who are in this audience will remember, is in any interview, I ask, when you are dead, and if you could actually listen to what people are saying at your funeral, what do you think they will say about you? Right? How would you like to be remembered? And this is what I ask myself every day. Not because I want to be remembered as somebody who has achieved a lot and things like that, but was I good for future generations? Because at the end of the day, you and I know we are living in a terrible, terrible world right now, you know, climate change and all these challenges. How do I leave the world better for future generations because my parents worked so hard to give me a good life and to give me good education. How do I live knowing that I leave the, the world a little better for other people, all right? So I think then if you ask yourself these questions, it will come to you. It will come to you that these are the things you need to improve on. These are the things you need to strengthen on. These are the things you need to tone down a little bit. This is where you need to be a bit more humble. Here's where you lower your expectations of yourself. And I think that process is only something that you yourself can do and no one can teach you or tell you what to do. Thank you for that. Okay, so earlier Dan had a question. It's like, why aren't the men in the audience asking any questions? <laughs> so I'm going to put some people on the spot here, but think about it. We'll take some... Oh, we have one here, this gentleman. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm Saleh. I'm Saleh. I'm a forester by profession. Yes, I am. <laughs> I would like first to congratulate um, <laughs> the organizers and the ladies, the speakers. First, I'd like to answer that question, women in leadership, too hot to handle. <laughs> in my experience, they're never too hot. I've had the pleasure of uh, working with men in a number of times in my life and I found them cold and you had to stir the fire to make it them hot you know? <laughs> and you've got to know how to do that yeah? but my question to the panel is um, you know there is a saying that behind every successful man is a woman. Question is, is it true? Is the reverse true? Behind every successful woman is a man. Thank you. Someone asked my husband this. <coughs> um, he said, you know, behind every successful, maybe you meet my husband, he's very calm, zen human being, right? And he would say, behind every successful man, there is definitely a woman. Behind every successful woman, there is a suffering man. <laughs> uh, and, I think, uh, and I think he's right, right? Because, I mean, the sacrifices that he has made for, for me to be able to do what I, I do. Um, but I think we need each other. I think that it's a mutually uh, dependent relationship. It's a partnership between men and women. You know, I think that 
I, I'm not one of those who's just openly critical that men are always taking away our privileges. No, I think we've got to make sure that they see it from our point of view because they can be the best partners you can ever have. Um, you know, and I think that is the way we need to approach it. By the way, I'm a huge fan of yours. I think you've done amazing work for forestry in our country. Uh, so we all know you. <clears throat> um, and I think that uh, this is this is something that, at least in my opinion, it's never really, you know, we, ne we never even think about it. We never even, uh, you know, my husband and I are best friends, right, from 44 years so as a best, my best friend. Uh, so we, we don't try to second guess each other. We just know that when we need support, we're there for each other. You know what my husband calls me? Well, he, he said this a lot to his friends, colleagues, the former colleagues. Um, I can't live without my wife because she's my city bank. <laughs> so I'm known amongst kind of the network of my husband's friends as his city bank, right? Can't live without me, so, which is not a bad thing probably. But I do believe truly in partnership. Right. Uh, this is not about you know who's behind who. It's about partnership at the end of the day. Um, I did share early on that you know when we started off, both of us uh, were in Shell. Uh, you know, once upon a time, and he has left Shell a couple of years ago, and he made a lot of uh, sacrifice, right, in order for me to be able to progress in my career. And in fact, at that time, I was the one who was actually nervous about the whole decision. Um, and I actually, we sat down together and I said to him, I'm willing to, you know, stay put, yeah, in, in the position that I was at that point in time and that was uh, here in Malaysia, um, you know, to allow him to continue his career in Malaysia. And you know what he said to me? I've been with Shell for a long time, longer than you, and he's a little bit senior than me. And he said, look, I, I think I've done enough and this is the time for me to support you. And, you know, I was so nervous about the whole decision because I think we were, you know, dual career couple for the longest time. And he had to convince me that was the right decision. And when we moved, so we moved countries, um, and he truly committed to his words, right? He supported me. He was there for the kids, for the uh, family, and I was doing all the traveling. Um, and... And looking back, I don't think I would be able to achieve what I've achieved so far without that support and partnership at home. Yep. Well, do we have time for one more question? Yep, okay, let's do one more before we wrap this up. Do you have any questions from the audience? Yes, we right at the front. Hi, uh, I'm Hani uh, from Bank Negara. So I have a question. I am still new in the career world, just my two years. So do you have the best advice if, uh, for a young generation like me to be bold and brave to take a senior leader role in a corporate world? <laughs> corporate world. <so laughs> I, you know, I, I would say a couple of things, right? Um, first of all, focus on building your foundation. Um, you know, and it could, well, in, in your space, I guess it's more in the financial side of things. Uh, focus on building that foundation, right? And keep your options open at the same time. Yeah, I mean, when I was an engineer, you know, and I started off as an engineer, I wanted to effectively just deepen uh, my, uh, my skills and capabilities at that point in time. But I knew very well that I didn't want to be an engineer for the rest of my career. So I kept my options very open. Eh? So I was looking for broadening opportunities and so on. Um, and that would be my advice, right? So focus on, you know, uh, building that foundation, but at the same time, keep your options open. Um, Career journey, if I were to describe it, is like a mountain range. So whilst you set your ambition, it doesn't mean that it's going to be a linear path towards that ambition. It's like a mountain range, right? You go you know, to the peak and you, you know, kind of descend down and you go up again. 
And through that journey, there are always going to be challenges. There are always going to be pinpoints. You make mistakes, and it's okay to make mistakes. And I think Tansri, you spoke about this, right? The failure festival, as you call it. I love that, by the way. And and you know, I would love to introduce that within Shell. But you know, that's the kind of stuff that we need to be able to do, right? Make mistakes. Uh, you know, bounce back quickly. Learn from the mistakes. And at the same time, don't forget to step back and also celebrate your successes. I, I think, you know, and I've seen this before, right? Because we work hard and we want to prove ourselves. Sometimes we forget to just pause for a while, right? And celebrate ourselves. Do take time to do that, right? As I said, I think, you know, if I were to describe my own journey, it's like a mountain range. It's a journey. Uh, it will never stop, I would say. I would add, always be curious. Right? I, my, when I was in school, <coughs> I was in Asunta school, right? So missionary school and all that. Anyone from Asunta here? Yay! Okay. All right. Okay. So, so we, we had to fill life cards when we were in school. So what's your ambition? Mine was arranged. Concert pianist, you know, novelist, you know, not, never a doctor. Never. And this is a true story. Until one day, uh, I was looking at my friend's life card, and every year she puts doctor. And I said to her, I'm going to be very honest in this conversation, right? I said, hey, why? Eh? You always want to be doctor. How do you know what you want to be at 15 or 12 or something like that? And she turned around very cheekily and very innocently looked at me. She said, Jamila, we Indians become doctors. <laughs> The Chinese ones will become businessmen, accountant. You Malays ah, become teacher, become, you know. So the next year, I put doctor, 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 <laughs> doctor, doctor, right? Because I was challenged, right? And, uh, you know, and I, she's still my good friend till today. You know, I owe going to medicine because of her. Um, and, and uh, you know, and she didn't become a doctor, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, but the, the, the thing is that, you know, it was, it's wonderful to be a doctor, right? I've delivered 15,000 babies. I think half of Petronas are my babies. Um, uh, but, but the reality is that along the way, I was curious, right? That, that, that nine-year-old walking in the monsoon drain woke up and said, hang on a minute. You know, I lost my father at 11. You know, um, you know, I have to do things for my parents. I have to be a good person. I have, and I, I, I can't understand why is it all always white people helping dark-skinned people? Where are we, right? So that was my drive, and you know, and I became a humanitarian. You know, I led Mercy Malaysia, but also at ten years, I said I have to leave because good leaders must leave, <clears throat> right? <laughs> so, 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 you know, that other new leaders come in and bring new ideas. And I was telling uh, you earlier, Cynthia, that you know, I then became a big fish in a small pond in Malaysia. Everybody knew who Dr. Jamila was then, right? I had to be a small fish in a big pond for me to learn. That's why I went out of the country, so that I could learn and bring back the learning to, to my country. And one of my friends said, hang on a minute, you've become a big fish in a big pond now. But alhamdulillah, it's not because I, I want it to be, but because of the lessons I've learned and the curiosity, the constant curiosity that I have. My colleagues call it chaos, not curiosity, because I can do 100 things at the same time. But you know, you never know, my dear. You're two years into the career. You could be sitting here, you know, leading a major organization in the future because you were curious enough to challenge yourself to do something different. But all the time, be self-aware, be authentic, be yourself, be willing to learn because there's so much that we can do. You both are so inspirational. Thank you so much for sharing your journey and your story with us. We truly, truly appreciate it. And thank you so much for your questions. Um, this wraps up the discussion, but we do have refreshments served outside, so please feel free to bring them in and uh, ming mingle, network. Tansri, don't go into hiding just yet. Stay for a bit. <laughs> uh, do that later at home. So yes, thank you so much once again. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who made time to be here this evening. And yes, enjoy the rest of the evening. And yeah. Happy, happy, International oh, happy International Women's Day. That's coming up on Friday.